Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Semiotics and Signs. Uh, there we go. All right. So, what is semiotics? If you just look into a dictionary for a definition of semiotics, it's usually the meaning of signs. But it's a lot deeper than that. And what we're going to be looking at is one of the works from Thomas Seabook, Seabook, I don't know how to say his name, Seabick. And uh, well, anyways, he's like the main author on semiotics. And all other texts I've found refer to him. And I figured this would be a good way to learn about it is to study his book, An Introduction to Semiotics, Signs. And this is a second edition by Thomas Seabick. Okay, so this was the uh, first edition was 1994, 1999 reprinted, and second edition is 2001. And he was born 1920. So, uh, very briefly here, we're going to go over the basic, uh, the forward here. Uh, there's basic notions of the object of semiotics, defining the sign, structural properties, semiosis. And representation, types of signs, nonverbal communication. We go to the study of signs, a biological approach to the study of signs, messages, the sign, signs, and reality. Then there's the six species of signs, the general features of signs. And we go over those and signal. Symptom, icon, index, symbol, name. So those are our six species. We have signal, symptom, icon, index, symbol, and name. Interesting. On the being, behaving, and becoming of signs. Symptom signs, the meaning of symptom, the Perikian point, the Perikian view, symptoms and the medical origins of semiotics. We think of the signs of symptoms, right? The semiotics. Why we say signs, we're talking about a symptom. Signs refers to the semiotics. So did you know that there's a, the medical component to semiotics? Interpreting symptoms. And there's indexical signs for the index, indexicality, the features of indexicality, manifestations of indexicality, and the study of indexicality. Then there's iconic signs, iconicity, the incidence of iconicity, the features of iconicity, and the study of iconicity. Then there's fetish signs. The origin of fetishism as deviation, fetish in psychology and psychology and sexology, and the fetish in semiotics. Then there's the language signs, the study of the verbal sign, verbal and nonverbal signing. Language is a primary modeling system. There's the modeling system, the model language as a modeling system, and concluding remarks. And then there's going to be a glossary at the end. The bibliography for our references and an index. <laughs> Interesting enough, the indexicality of the book will be manifested in the index. So before I lose everyone, I want to see if uh, I see we get an audit them in the house. If my audio is good and everything, just let me know and make sure you have your Esquire pencil ready for sure because we're not going to go through the whole book. We're just going to zoom through here so that everyone can leave with a working knowledge of semiotics. You'll be able to recognize how semiotics affects us in our day-to-day our -day, uh, interactions, transactions, and such, and how we can better interpret semiotics for benefits throughout our lives and get a more enriching experience in life. All right, so let's check this out here. The second edition, all right, let's get past this because this is talking about the edition. You know, the forward, I think, is... Uh, all right, well, the, Thomas Seabick is universally associated with the development of semiotics and communication theory in the 20th century. So we're reading his book. 
All right, we don't need, we've already, we're already in it. We don't need to be, uh, this is a good one here. So let's look at this real quick here. Uh, the opening chapter, Basic Notions, is new to the second edition. It presents a clear and illustrated style, the basic concepts of semiotic analysis. The second chapter, The Study of Science, constitutes an overview. All right, from far, far away, we get uh, greetings. Yeah, and please hit the like if you are just entering. All right, so we're going over semiotics. Let's continue. So the study of science con constitutes an overview of the intriguing study of human semio semiosis, including a delineation of the scientific field of semiotics. The third chapter, the six species of signs, delineates and illustrates the six fundamental categories of signs, signal, symptom, icon, index, symbol, name. Let's think about these for a second. What are some signals that you can think of that have meaning, a semiotic meaning, right? Uh, we have things like our traffic signals, right? There's all kinds of hand signals, right? Those are signs. They're, they're, they're semiotic. So there's symptom, the sign of a cold, sign of a sore throat, right? Icon, sign of an icon. We see these frequently in computers now, right? An index, the sign of an index. What does an index mean? It means where you refer to other things. Google is a search index, you know. Symbol. We all know symbols from brands, things like that. And then huh, name, of course. So there's semiotic characteristics to these categories. And we're going to dive deep into them. So we make these distinctions and we uh, basically can figure out their functions in reality. Since these are symbols that are creations of our own mind. Let's continue. What becomes clear from this chapter is that semiosis is the defining characteristic of biological life. Then, in chapter 4, Symptom Signs, Seabook focuses on the nature of symptoms. It is instructive to note that the analysis of the body's genetically programmed system of symptoms that indicate patterns of disease in the ancient world laid the foundation for the science of signs. So yes, uh, the act of interpreting symptoms constitutes the essence of semiotic, semiotic analysis. A symptom stands for some malfunction or interrupted bodily process, which in the mind of the physician points to or represents a disease, ailment, or malady. Interesting uh, concept here, huh? A symptom stands for some malfunction or interrupted bodily process, which in the mind of the physician points to or represents a disease, ailment, or malady. In Chapter 5, Indexical Signs, Seabick then examines what is arguably the most fundamental category of conscious signing, indexicality. In human semiosis, this inheres in the process of pointing out the objects, events, and beings in the world. Indexicality can manifest itself in sign tokens that range all the way from the pointing action of the index finger to the use of words such as here and there. In the sixth chapter, Iconic Signs, Seabook then examines the nature of iconicity, the signifying process by which a sign represents its, re its referent. Hang on a second. The signifying process by which a sign represents its referent by stimulating one or all of its physical or no, it cool properties. Man, we got some words here to look up. Let's look these up real quick here. 
I'll yeah, look these up real quick for us. Re referent, I think it means to refer to, right? So let's just make sure. Uh, yeah, thing I wrote that denotes or stands for. And who's this other strange word we came across here was noetical. Of or concerning sailors or navigators. No, wait, not sorry, wrong one. Oh, geez. Oh, come on, really? All right, well, it's a misprint. This was a scanned document. Oh, gosh, properties. Well, it's physical, whatever this means here. Utilizing a broad range of examples from nature, Seabook treatment drives home the point that iconicity constitutes a central principle of semiotic organization and patterning in all life forms. The essential principle, right? This is interesting here, that this is referring to uh, the physical properties, right? Iconicity. By, stim by simulating one or all of its physical properties, utilizing a broad range of examples from nature, Seabook's treatment drives on the point that iconicity constitutes a central principle of semiotic organization and patterning in all life forms. Then, in the seventh chapter, Fetish Signs, Seabook takes a delightful excursion into an area that clearly illustrates the nature of symbolic semiosis in humans, fetish signs. Although fetishism is found in primates and mammals, it is a phenomenon that silently illustrates how semiosis interconnects biological, psychological, and cultural processes in the human species. The fetish is a microcosm of what we are, consumers of symbols. In chapter 8, Language Signs, Seabook then brings us into the exclusively human domain of verbal semiosis. Language is the ultimate achievement of the body-mind-culture transformational semiotic process. But, as he cogently reminds us, it is not always a superior one to the nonverbal mode of knowing and signing. Not always superior the linguistic or the language based, right? To the nonverbal mode of knowing and signing. Interesting here, huh? So human communication must be thought of in its tonality as a verbal and nonverbal process. Finally, in the last chapter, language as a primary modeling system, Seabook provides us with one of the clearest and most plausible accounts of the origin and evolution of language in the human species. Language for Seabook is an effective cognitive means for modeling the world. It developed to allow humans to portray the world around them in an efficient way. Speech, or articulated language, is a derivative of this modeling capacity. It is to use a recently coined biological term, an expectation, oh gosh, from the language capacity. In essence, I don't know if some of these words are even correctly scanned, uh, from the language capacity. In essence, Seabook argues that nonverbal signing is more fundamental to survival, both phylogenic phylogenically and autogenetically than is verbal signing. <laughs> so for those who don't know these simple words here, like phylogenetic refers to, let's say here, let's get you a full definition here. Come on. Relating to the evolutionary development diversification of a species or group of organisms. Of a particular feature of an organism, so the the phylogenetic relationship of the mammalian species, right? Mammary glands, and uh, what's the other word we had here? We were looking at. Well, ontologically is uh, would be the meaning. C. Ontologically relating to the branch of it. Okay, so showing the relations between the concepts and categories in a subject area or domain. 
well said. So, all right. We should do a stream on ontology. Oh, boy. Now, that gets really uh, complicated there because uh, these days with uh, digital forms. It is difficult, indeed, to formulate a single theme as a characteristic of these intellectually fascinating pages, other than the idea that semiosis is life. Seabook's treatment documents the manifestations of semiosis in vastly different species, from termites to humans, and lead us to conclude that the ability to manufacture signs is a basic survival strategy in all life forms. In humans, the persistence of the iconic mode of thought suggests that the concepts start out as mimetic or osmotic portrayals of the physical environment. These are at first tied to the operations of our sensory apparatus. It is only after they have become routine, routinized through cultural diffusion that they become free of sensory control and take on an abstract quality. For Seabook, iconicity lies at the core of how human organism responds to the world. Like the great biologist Jacob von whatever, okay, whose discovery by North American scientists is due in large part to Seabook's effort. Seabook finds a point of contact between a mainstream scientific approach to the study of organisms, biology, and that of the strictly semiotic tradition. J. von Uxkull argued that every organism had different inward and outward lives. The key to understanding this duality is in the anatomical structure of the organism itself. Animals with widely divergent Animals with widely divergent anatomies do not live in the same kind of world. There exists, therefore, no common world of reference shared by humans and animals equally. The work of von Uxkull and Seabook have shown that an organism does not perceive an object in itself, but according to its own particular kind of pre-existent mental modeling system, that allows it to interpret the world of beings, objects, and events in a biologically programmed way. Uh, for Seabook, this system is grounded in the organism's body, which routinely converts the external world of experience into an internal world, internal one of representation, in terms of the particular features of the modeling system with which a species is endowed. Um... I'd like to take a break on this for one second just to, uh, let's see here. <laughs> oh, gosh, that's a good one there. Oh, man. Oh, we gotta, that's, that's a perfect uh, comment here. All right. So, sign language on the broadcast. Uh, uh, Yeah, but it's not Tuesday, so no tacos today. All right, we all got our Esquire pencils out. We're ready to go. Um, what I wanted to mention here is that there's a problem with this particular interpretation here, and this is kind of a characteristic of uh, of a lot of what you'll find in the uh, what you call the Kantian school of, of philosophy, to believe that these internal representation systems, right, these modeling systems are endowed, species endowed, meaning you're born with them. The only problem with this is that this overlooks the concept of adaptability, meaning that as the environment changes, these specific systems, right, that you're endowed with are hardwired, they can't adapt with the environment. And see, that's a slippery slope there, that you're, you're a victim, you can't get out of your trap of the endowed uh, modeling systems. So it's not complete. You know, then there's the ones where we're totally free to think up what, you know, we want for, you know, our, what we want to believe and such. But then that leaves us, uh, basically with no holdings on to reality and quickly get lost into the mysticism. So having a symbolic system that can, uh, encapsulate both, you know, the species endowed portions of our modeling systems 
and the adaptability ones through, you know, what we call the, uh, the modeling system in the symbolic form, symbolic form. So this is getting into a way of, of uh, further identifying the symbolic forms in the cases of signs. So this is one particular kind of symbolic form. Probably the most important kind is signs, and it, it goes beyond humans. This is probably one that we somewhat share with other species of animals. Yet uh, the humans' particular types of modeling system is not specifically species endowed entirely, whereas other animals it perhaps is. And I think that's one main distinction in philosophy that you know the, the best philosophies are probably the more modern ones where they have a, a proper type of uh, alignment with or harmonization, I should say, of the mathematical, philosophical map models in the humanistic ones without drifting into the slippery slope of mysticism. Okay, let's proceed here. Uh, please say it again. Didn't quite get that name. Which uh, which name was that? Oh, I get it. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> oh, it's getting late. I'm losing the my sense of humor somewhat. All right. So C book trans has transformed semiotics back into a life science, having relocated in effect to its roots in medical biology. Again, I have I take. Uh, uh, you know, there's a, a way of looking at that's not rooted entirely in medical biology, but he does have these concepts because he's he's finding the commonalities between the patterns that animals use and, and systems of semiotics in humans. But I believe that there's going to be certain species of semiotics of signs that humans use much more than other animals, and that's probably what sets us apart. And that's what this book is going to definitely get into. The Udo name, I know. It's, it's, you see it on the screen, so if anyone speaks German, uh, you know, then you can, uh, you can give me a phonetic spelling. In other words, he has uprooted semiotics from the philosophical, linguistic, and hermeneutic terrain in which it has been cultivated for centuries and replanted it in the larger biological domain whence it sprang originally. Seabook's biological approach in here's in a perspective that aims to investigate how all animals are endowed genetically with the capacity to use basic signals and signs for survival, and how human symbiosis is both similar to and different from this capacity. See, we have quite different ones from this in the case that I think we have some uh, hypertrophied or very overdeveloped species of semiotics that are outlined later those characteristics in the later chapters, those six species of semiotics or of signs. And if you want to look at, I did a, a, a live stream on the law as symbolic form with Ernest Cassira, and that one actually gets into deeper in these philosophical approaches I speak of. And if you do like the idea of philosophy but don't like to read philosophers or like to read a lot of thick, hard-to-read books, Read Kassira. Uh He is probably one of the best, uh, uh, one of my favorites. You know, he he's the, uh, in, in my particular flavor of philosophy, being a synthetic abstractionist, that he takes concepts of varying types and is able to, from the foundations of them, to synthesize entirely new philosophy. And that's what he has done with his symbolic forms. Um all right, now I'm getting too far in the weeds. Let's continue. Uh, okay, so he distills rudimentary elements of semiosis from animate reality so as to establish a taxonomy of notions. So we're going to have a little library of notions here, words of notions, principles, and procedures for understanding the uniqueness of human semiosis. The result is a program for studying human knowing as a biological capacity that transforms sensory-based and effectively motivated responses into a world of mental models. So let me break this down here. So studying human knowing, so epistemology, as a biological capacity, innate ability that transforms sensory-based 
and effectively motivated. So we can say receptor and effector. We have sensors, our seeing, hearing, uh, taste, feeling, right? And effective, our muscles, our voice, things like that to affect, to influence the environment. So it transforms our sensory base and effectively motivated responses into a world, transforms them into a world of mental models. Casira would call them symbolic forms. Signs are forged within the human organism as extensions of the body's response system. No matter how bizarre or unearthly the shape of creatures which might inhabit alien planets, we are likely to recognize them as animals nonetheless. The chief basis for this recognition is that they are bound to give off signs of life. There's no doubt in my mind that the reader will find Seabook, in comparison to other major figures in the field of semiotics, quite enjoyable to read. But underlying his masterful ability to convey a sense of enjoyment is a deep understanding of semiosis. Indeed, in having transformed the mainstream study of semiosis into a life science, Seabook has greatly expanded the nature of semiotic inquiry and attracted in the process more and more interest in it from the behavioral, cognitive, and social sciences. As he argues throughout the pages of this book, a biologically based semiotics will allow us to get a glimpse into how the body interacts with the mind to produce signs, messages, thought, and ultimately, cultural behavior. So if we're looking ultimately right, to produce a cultural behavior, we need to understand semiotics, because that's the only way we're going to get a glimpse into how so the body actually interacts with the mind to produce these things. So uh, this book is intended to be both a synthetic overview of biosemiotics, beautiful, and a compendium of practical illustrations showing how that discipline can inform and potentially expand the method of inquiry in both semiotics and biology. Each chapter contains numerous practical exemplifications and insights into the potential applications of semiotics to the study of cross-species modeling. Nonetheless, writing is not so diluted as to make it an overly simplified treatment. Some effort to understand the... Okay, so we're, we're talking about books here. Science, Introduction to Semiotics. So what I want to do with, uh, with this stream here is I don't want to get it too long because it's pretty late tonight and we're at the half hour mark. But um, we're going to go over the basic notions here and because this is actually part of the second edition. It wasn't in the previous editions. And this gives a really good overview of semiotics in general. And we're going to, browse, we're going to go through this as quickly as we, as we can. I'd like to finish this chapter quick. Because then we can finish up the, uh, the other chapters that are going to be important, especially the one where we detail the types of signs in a future live stream. So yeah, let's uh, basic notions. So the, the phenomenon that distinguishes life forms from inanimate objects is semiosis. So this is the distinguishing phenomena. It can be defined simply as the instinctive capacity of all living organisms to produce and understand signs. A sign is a physical form that has been imagined or made externally through some physical medium to stand for an object, event, feeling, etc., known as a referent or for a class of similar or related objects, events, feelings, etc., known as a referential domain. In human life, signs serve many functions. They allow people to recognize patterns in things. They act as predictive guides or plans for taking actions. They serve as exemplars of specific kinds of phenomena. The list could go on and on. The English word cat, for example, is an example of a particular kind of human sign, known as verbal, which stands for a referent that can be described as a carnivorous animal with a tail, whiskers, and a retractile claws. Each species produces and understands certain kinds of specific signs for which it has been programmed by its biology. 
These can range from simple bodily signals to advanced symbolic structures, such as words. Signs allow each species to 1. Signal its existence, 2. Communicate messages within the species, and 3. Model incoming information from the external world. Semiotics is a science that studies these functions. Three things signal its existence. First, for a species to signal its existence, I'm here. Communicate messages within the species and model incoming information from the external world. Semiotics is a science that studies these functions. The goal of this opening chapter is to introduce several basic notions for the formal study of semiosis. So the object of semiosis. Um, we're going to skip this because this is getting, this gets really historical and long. And you guys can always look into this later. Um, yeah, I think we're at the, uh, yeah, let's look at this one here. Structural properties. Hey, we got Rob Cleveland in the house. Beautiful. We got, we got a crowd here. All right, so we're going to read about the structural property. So we're we're doing semiotics here. Again, this is uh this is uh, basically how we uh, it's a study of the difference between illusion and reality, and how uh, species are able to use everything from humans to animals are able to use these signs in a way to aid their survival and interaction with the environment. So let's see here: structural properties, signs of all types are recognizable. As such, because they have certain predictable and regular properties or structures. For example, most human signs have the capacity to encode two primary kinds of reference, denotative and connotative, depending on usage and situation. Denotation is the initial referent a sign intends to capture, but the denoted referent or Denotatum is not something specific in the world, but rather a prototypical category of something. So again, the sign of a cat, when we say the word cat, it's not a particular cat, but a prototypical category of that referent, the cat. So the sign, right, denotes a referent, and that referent is not a specific physical thing, in the world, but a prototypical category of something. For instance, now here we go, the word cat does not refer to a specific cat, although it can, but to the category of animals that we recognize as having the quality catness. <laughs> hey, catness. The denotative meaning of cat is, therefore, really catness. A prototypical mental picture marked by specific, distinctive features such as mammal retractile claws, long tail, etc. This composite mental picture allows us to determine if a specific, real, or imaginary animal under consideration will fall within the category of catness. Now, in human semiosis, a sign can be extended freely to encompass other kinds of reference that appear by association or analogy to have something in common with the denotatum, right? That's the denoted referent. This existential process is known as connotation. Okay, so this is the, the when we extend the denotation, right, by association or analogy, and that's called connotation. And the new reference are known as the connotata. <laughs> Consider the use of the word cat. How about the word cat and connotata? <laughs> All right, consider the use of the word cat in the following two sentences. He's a cool cat. Person who appears to have favorable feline qualities. And two, the cat is out of the bag in reference to a secret being revealed. Note that the original referent is implicit in such extensional uses. Any connotative extension of the word cat is thus constrained by the distinctive features of the referent, referent, ah, whichever way you want to say that. So basically the referent 
is the cat. And cats can be cool. Cats can be, you know, have a bag. They can be troublesome, right? Just like a secret being revealed. So these are all qualities of cats, right? Um, so the dis- they're not being denoted specifically. They're being con- connotated because we're talking about a person, right? In a situation, not the animal cat itself. So we're not denotating the cat when we say cat with this word. We're connotating with the connotata, right? So let's continue. Note that the original referent is implicit. It's implied. And such extensional uses. We're extending the denotata, right, by analogy or association. Any connotative extension of the word cat is thus constrained by the distinctive features of the referent. That's the class of cat. Such distinctions of meaning crystallize through the inbuilt, inbuilt properties of signs known as oh shit, paradigmaticity. Paradigmat, dig, dig, oh paradigmaticity. Paradigmaticity. Consider the following word pairs. <laughs> Pin bin, fun pun, duck luck. The initial sound of each pair is different and sufficient to indicate a difference in reference. This differentiation pattern, a different differentiation feature of signs is known as a paradigmatic structure, i.e. the relation whereby some minimal feature in a sign is sufficient to keep it differentiated from all other signs of the same kind. Now, note that the above words are legitimate signs not only because they are differentiable in a specific way, but also because the combination of sounds with which they are constructed is consistent with the English syllable structure. On the other hand, well, I can't say these words here, but would not be legitimate signs in English because they violate its syllable structure. Syllable structure is known technically as... Syntagmatic structure, i.e. the relation where, whereby signs are constructed in some definable sequence or combination. Messages can be constructed on the basis. Oh, which word was that? Do you want me to say ten times? Was it syntagmatic or diagmatic? Paradi- paradi- paradigmatic. Paradigmatic and synt- syntagmatic. Synt- geez, okay, never mind. Yeah, it's too late <laughs> to be saying those words that many times. You're lucky you're getting this out of me. Okay, messages can be constructed on the basis of single signs or, more often than not, <clears throat> as combinations of them. The latter are known as text. A text constitutes, in effect, a specific weaving together of signs in order to communicate something. The signs that go into the makeup of texts belong to specific codes. Paradigmatic. (laughs) That's how it's uh, pronounced. (laughs) These can be defined as systems of signs that are held together by paradigmatic and syntagmatic relations. Cartesian geometry, for instance, is a code because it has specific kinds of structural properties. Now, this is this code can be used to make certain kinds of texts. For example, maps with latitude and longitude lines, certain city de- designs, as for downtown Manhattan, and so on. Language, too, is a code because it has paradigmatic, pin versus bin, and syntagmatic, plan but not plan, properties. Needless to say, it also can be used to make certain kinds of texts, for example, conversations, novels, poems, etc. So language is a code, too. Clearly, a text bears no meaning unless the receiver of the text knows the codes from which it was constructed, and unless the text refers to 
occurs in or entails some specific context. The context is the environment, the physical, physiological, and social in which a sign or text is used or occurs. So again, the semiosis and representation. So let's get this one here. The primary objective of semiotics is to understand both a species' capacity to make and understand signs and, in the case of the human species, the knowledge-making activity this capacity allows human beings to carry out. The former is known, as mentioned above, as semiosis, while the later activity, latter activity, is known as representation. Hmm, so understand a species' capacity to make and understand signs, right? Knowledge making activity, right? That allows human beings to carry out. So, representation is a deliberate use of signs to probe, classify, and hence know the world. Semiosis is the biological capacity itself that underlies the production and comprehension of signs from simple physiological signals to those that reveal a highly complex symbolism. So in farting, um, uh, semio semiotically speaking, yeah, I guess that would be a, 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 a faradigmatic uh, <laughs> expression. Human intellectual and social life is based on the production, use, and exchange of signs and representations. When we gesture, talk, write, read, watch a TV program, listen to music, look at a painting, etc., we are engaged in sign-based representational behavior. Representation has endowed the human species with the ability to cope effectively with the crucial aspects of existence. Knowing, behaving purposefully, planning, socializing, and communicating. However, since representational activities vary from culture to culture, the signs people use on a daily basis constitute a meditating, a mediating template in the worldview they come to have. See, since representational activities vary from culture to culture, the signs people use on a daily basis constitute a mediating template in the worldview they come to have. So, when it comes down to this whole concept of uh, slavery, right? What signs do people use on a daily basis that constitute that mediating template in the worldview that they come to have? Interesting stuff that representation has endowed the human species with the ability to cope effectively with the crucial aspects of existence. Knowing, behaving purposefully, planning, socializing, and communicating. However, since representational activities vary, see, this is the thing from culture to culture, that you get mixed signs that could cause some type of shift in that worldview. Let's see here. The types of signs. So the six major types of signs that semiotics has cataloged and investigated as well as we shall see in the book, remainder of this book. Here it is, use, is useful simply to introduce them and characterize them generically. The first type of sign is the symptom. The bodies of all animals produce symptoms as warning signs, but what they indicate will depend on the species. As a biologist, here you go, is Sly still there? Jacob von Luxkull, 1909, argued the symptom is a reflex of anatomical structure. A reflex. Symptom is a reflex of the stru anatomical structure. Animals with widely divergent anatomies will manifest virtually no symptomology in common. It is interesting to note, by the way, that the term symptom is often extended metaphorically to refer to intellectual emotional, and social phenomena that result from causes that are perceived to be analogous to physical processes. Their behavior is a symptom of our times. Their dislike of each other is a symptom 
of circumstances, etc. Ah, so symptom has been extended metaphorically because symptom should only refer to particular reflexes of anatomical structure. Hmm. A second type. So that's our uh, connotata, <laughs> whatever, the connotative uh, sign. A second type of sign is the signal. All animals are endowed with the capacity to use and respond to species-specific signals for survival. Birds, for instance, are born prepared to produce a particular type of coo, and no amount of exposure to the songs of other species or the absence of their own has any effect on their cooing. A bird reared in isolation, in fact, will sing a very simple outline of the sort of song that would develop naturally in that bird born in the wild. This does not mean, however, that animal signaling is not subject to environmental or adaptational factors. Many bird species have developed regional cooing dialects by apparently imitating each other. Most signals are emitted automatically in response to specific types of stimuli and affective states and because manifestations of animal signaling are truly remarkable. It is little wonder that they often trick people into seeing much more in them than is actually there. A well-known example of how easily people are duped by animal signaling is the case of Clever Hans, as will be discussed below. A large portion of bodily communication among humans also unfolds largely in the form of unwitting signals. It has been shown, for example, that men are sexually attracted to women with large pupils, which signal unconsciously a strong and sexually tinged interest, as well as making females look younger. This would explain the fashion vogue in Central Europe during the 1920s and 1930s of women using ew, a crystalline alkaloid eye drop derived from belladonna. Holy shit. The devil's trumpet. A beautiful woman in Italian. The women of the day used this drug because they believed, and correctly so, it would appear that it would enhance facial appearance and sexual attractiveness by dilating the pupils. Boy, that stuff will put you on a serious trip. You'll be talking to the devil with that stuff. Grows all over the place here. But humans are capable as well of deploying witting signals for some intentional purpose. I.g. nodding, winking, glancing... Looking, not, not, nudging, kicking, head tilting. And what was the other one uh, that Paul was talking about? The head bob. That's not in here. And, 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 and stargazing. <laughs> As a psychologist, Carl Bueller aptly observed, such signals act like regulators, eliciting or inhibiting some action or reaction. Signaling systems can also be created for conventional social purposes. The list of such symptoms is extensive and includes railway signals, smoke signals, semaphores, telegraph signals, Morse code signals, warning lights, flares, beacons, bail fires, red flags, warning lights, traffic lights, alarms, distress signals, danger signals, whistles, trains, bleepers, bleepers, buzzers, knocking, gongs, bells, and drums. The next three types of signs are taken from Pierce's classification of signs as icons, indexes, and symbols. An icon is a sign that is made to resemble, stimulate, or reproduce its referent in some way. Photographs may be iconic signs because they can be seen to reproduce their reference in a visual way. Onomatopo Onomatopoeic words are also iconic signs because they stimulate, like achoo, uh, onoma onomatopoeic words are also iconic signs because they stimulate their reference in an acoustic way. Commercially produced perfumes that are suggestive of certain natural scents are likewise iconic because they stimulate the scents in an artificial way. List could go on and on. The manifestations of iconicity can be seen across species, suggesting that the ability to manufacture concrete, simulative representations of the world, consciously or unconsciously, is a basic 
semiotic capacity in most, if not all, life forms. An index is a sign that refers to something or someone in terms of its existence or location in time or space, or in relation to something or someone else. Smoke is an index of fire, pointing out where the fire is. A cough is an index of a cold. See, it's not a symptom, it's an index, and so on. These signs do not resemble their reference. Like icons, they indicate or show where they are. They do not resemble them. They show where they are, indicate where they are. The most typical manifestation of indexicality is the pointing index finger. Where is it? So an index shows you where something is in a book, right? Uh, an index search result, Google shows you where that web page is. It points to it. It's a pointer, pointing index finger. So that's a good way to think of an index as a pointer, which humans the world over, use instinctively to point out and locate things, people, and events in the world. Many words, too, manifest an implicit form of indexicality. Here, there, up, down, refer to the relative location of things when we are speaking about them. A symbol is a sign that stands for its referent in an arbitrary, conventional way. Most semioticians agree that the symbolicity is what sets human representation, yes, apart from that of all other species, allowing the human species to reflect upon the world separately from stimulus response situations. So this is in the school of Kassira that they're talking about here. See, separate from the stimulus response or the, the uh, uh, receptor effector systems, right? It's the symbolic system. So you say here that that symbol symbolicity symbolicity, right? Symbolic uh, signs. Words in general are symbolic signs, but any signifier, object, sound, figure, etc., can be symbolic. A cross figure can stand for the concept Christianity. A V sign made with the index in the middle fingers can stand symbolically, symbolically for the concept victory. White is a color that can be symbolic of cleanliness, purity, or innocence, but dark of uncleanliness, impurity, or corruption. And the list could go on and on. These symbols are all established by social convention. The sixth and final type of sign to be discussed in this book is the name. Name. So we talk a lot about names. Yeah, the uh, V signs. This is an old book, V for Victory. Yeah, I guess it's actually not that old, but the author is, uh, well, 1920 was the author. I don't think we're reading the author yet, though, are we? No, this is the first chapter, so yeah, we're reading this. Uh, Siva. So he's an old cat. The sixth and final type of sign to be discussed in this book is the name. This is an identifier sign assigned to the member of a species in various ways, as we shall see and subsequently, that sets the specific member off from the others. A human name is a sign that identifies the person in terms of such variables as ethnicity and gender. Added names, surnames, nicknames, etc., further refine the identity referent of the name. Um, I want to focus on one little thing here. A human name is a sign that identifies the person in terms of such variables as ethnicity and gender. So whenever there's a discrimination issue, right, because someone's demanding your ID or your name, right, it could be a form of discrimination because by providing your name, you know, it's a uh, ethnicity and gender and then if there's a change of behavior after that point it could be because of discrimination because of the name i've seen this happening before added names surnames nicknames etc further refine the identity referent of the name so pretty pretty good stuff here so 
Let's see what part we're on here. So this part gets a little bit longer. So we're, this is, I think, a really good place for us to pause because I could start here at nonverbal communication for the next uh, for the next session. And I want to get through this chapter and then probably one or two of the other chapters. Is there any particular chapter that anyone in the audience uh, sees? Is hey, let me get I'll make a note of this page real quick before I move on. Uh, trusty paper here. And I think we're on uh, okay, page 23, nonverbal. And I wanted to get back up to the table of contents and see if uh, which one looks good, good for the next uh, one after we get through the introduction here. So we go to the study of signs. That eh, sounds boring. It's the six species of signs. This is going to be, of course, in depth to each of these different kinds. And then we get into the very detailed one of each one's a symptom, the indexical, the iconic, the fetish, language signs. Any of these look good? Primary uh, language, the modeling system. So any of these chapters look good for anyone here? You want to give me a number you got, uh, of a chapter you like? Here's eight for language, seven for fetish signs, six for iconic signs, five for indexical signs, four for symptom signs. This gets into some medical stuff, so if anyone's interested in medical symptoms. And if you just want, I think we should just go over the general deep dive into the six species here. We go on this chapter here. Any uh, preferences out there? Seven. Need content for Lou. What's seven? All right. All right. Seven. Uh, who else? Who else? Anything else has a... Uh, Okay, it is seven. Now, why did I think that was going to happen here? So seven looks like the one for the next one. So what we're going to do is we're going to finish up this chapter just to kind of, so we don't like, we have, we have a little foreplay before we get right into the fetish one, okay? And then we'll, we'll dive into chapter seven because there's not much more to this chapter we're on right now. We're on chapter one. And we're at, uh, let's see. Uh... Yeah, I guess we're still here. We're on page two right now. Here we are. Nonverbal communication. Okay, yeah, we made it through the whole thing. We just got a few more pages left. Well, actually, this is a long, long section. So we finish this chapter here. That'd be like foreplay, and then we move right to chapter seven. And that's going to be uh, looks like that's going to be interesting. And it doesn't look like it's too long, so it should be a quickie. All right. So I appreciate everyone coming along for this. This was a great, uh, a great stream. Oh, geez. I didn't realize this was on the screen the whole time, guys. Why don't you tell me this was lingering up there? Oh, Lord. Yeah, that's what we're going to do. Oh, yeah. And we'll use our index finger to point things out, of course. And, uh, yeah, well, that's another for Lou. Prince used that symbol. He used the OK symbol, didn't he? And, yeah, it'll be a quickie. We did uh, we did our hard uh, background stuff this time. And uh, I guess if you enjoyed seeing that caption that was on the screen the whole time, that's, that's fine, too. But if it does see anything annoying on the screen, definitely uh, give me a heads up in, in chat. Uh, love your pupils, my dear. Oh, gosh. Let's see what else we got here. I didn't read all this chat, boy. We got some pretty good stuff in here. Yeah, yeah, we got some uh, some cool stuff. All right, so yeah, we're looking forward to this. This is going to be good. Better signs is the one. I'll be on the next one. All right. So again, I appreciate everyone coming in for this. Make sure uh, you hit that like so that... Uh, you get notified of the bell too. You get hit the bell and you hit the like, hit the subscribe, and hopefully the algorithm will be polite enough to give you a notification in time. Otherwise, I try to do these uh, in the evening, late when there's no one else doing the live streams and everyone's done doing their thing and they're looking for some uh, nightcap. So that being the case, well, I really appreciate everyone sticking it out for me this late. I had to stay up late too, so I guess it's all good for everyone. And uh, on that note, I'd like to say have a great night. 
Thanks for coming and peace out.